In this video, we'll be looking at actual data from the Australian government's Bureau of Meteorology. Specifically, we'll be looking at their weather data to see if we can classify certain weather points and assign them to certain geographies based on a method called k-means clustering. So before we get into all that weather data and all the specifics, let's look at it at more of a high level. So let's just say we have some points in the xy plane, and right now it's not important what these variables x and y are. Um, in, in just a bit, we'll assign actual uh, kind of variables to these. So let's just say we have points in the xy plane. Here we have nine points, and the goal here is we're trying to assign them to a certain number of clusters. So let's say right now we don't even know how many clusters we want to assign them to. We just want to say, hey, given these nine points, can you assign them to a natural number of clusters? And most people will say, well, yeah, I, I see there's three clusters. There's, uh, there's one cluster consisting of these three points. There's one cluster consisting of these, and there's one cluster consisting of these. That's obvious to anyone, a lot of people would say. So we're going to call this cluster one, two, and three. But how do we solidify this notion? How do we put this in a mathematical standpoint so that a computer program or uh, some kind of method can be used to naturally detect these clusters? Because right now we're just kind of doing it visually, and we don't have a mathematical framework for it. So it turns out k-means clustering does exactly that. It gives a very basic, and this is important to note, k-means is kind of an introductory kind of clustering. It does work for a lot of high-level applications, but as we'll see, it does have its drawbacks. So what it does is it uses this metric right here, which maybe it looks a little scary right now, but it's okay, we'll walk through it uh, together here. Uh, it uses this metric right here to determine what the clusters will end up being. So what is, this, what is this telling us? This is a double sum, um, but really what it's saying is that we're going to walk over all k of these clusters. Okay, so this outer sum is going from cluster 1 to cluster k. So in our case, think of it as just going from cluster 1 to cluster 3. So we're, uh, an important thing to note in k-means clustering is that we need to tell it beforehand how many clusters we want, which we'll see is one of the major drawbacks, actually. So let's say we've told it we want three clusters um, because we see th kind of three distinct groups here. So we're going to go from i equals 1 to 3. And what we're going to do for each of those clusters, we're going to sum. Uh, we're going to sum the distances from each point in the cluster to the midpoint of the cluster. And this is why it's called k-means because this m sub i, uh, which sometimes you'll be seeing it as mu sub i, same thing really, is uh, the middle, the midpoint of each of these clusters. So specifically, what we're going to do, k-means clustering is going to pick uh, a point in each of these clusters as the midpoint, as the mean. So naturally, we're going to say that the means are going to be the ones that are actually in the middle. So we're going to say this guy here, this guy here, this guy here. So these three points are going to be the means. Um, so just to be clear, this is going to be m sub 1, uh, this is going to be m sub 2, and this is going to be m sub 3. It's keeping with the notation of this formula right here. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the distance from all points within that cluster to that mean. And what it's going to do, it's going to take that distance squared. So what we see here is the L2 norm squared. If you want, you could put a 2 here to make it clear. The L2 norm squared. And it's going to sum that over all three clusters. So, you know, this seems, maybe it's a still a little bit confusing. Let's do it concretely and see what happens. So given that the midpoints here, the means are M1, M2, and M3, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, in cluster 1, what's the distance from this left point here to the middle? And let's just say arbitrarily that distance is going to be 1. So we're going to have a 1 here. Now we're going to say, what's the next point in this cluster? Well, it's the mean itself, but the distance from the mean to itself is 0, so we just disregard that. What's the distance from this right-hand point to the middle? It's also 1. So for this, we have the total sum is a 2 because it's the 1 plus the 1. And by symmetry, these clusters are nice and symmetric, so it's going to be the same for all of them. So we look at cluster 2. The distance from this point to the middle is 1, and the distance from this point to the middle is 2. Now, um, since the distances are 1, we don't need to square them because 1 squared is 1. But notice if the distance were 2, we do 2 squared is 4, and we'd have that as the component instead of 1. So keep that in mind. So we have 2 plus 2 for the second cluster plus 2 for the third cluster equals 6. Okay, that's great. But like, what does it, why is that important? Why is this number even important to us? Because what we're actually trying to do with this metric here is we're trying to minimize it. We're trying to get the smallest number possible here. And why is this the smallest number possible? Well, if we, if we try to pick any other kind of group of points, for example, let's say we have a cluster consisting of, uh, for some reason we picked a cluster that consists of, let's say, these three points. I'm going to try to make it clear. This diagram is getting kind of cluttered. Okay, hopefully that's clear. We're going to do these three points, this one, this one, and this one. And let's say the middle we picked as this point right here. Now, this is already really bad because what's the, uh, in, what's the in cluster sum of squares here? So this is still going to be 1. This is unchanged, right, because the distance from here to here is 1. So we have a, uh, a 1. And then what's the distance from this middle here to this point all the way here? Let's just say it's something 
let's 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 say it's uh let's say it's even three okay it's probably it looks like a lot more than three but let's say it's three so three squared is nine and then we add that one so we have a 10 already so it doesn't even matter what the other clusters are because it's just going to add more positive values and this 10 is already greater than the six we had over here which kind of tells us roughly that this is the wrong clustering to use because we're making these distances really big so this is what k-means is doing given that you're going to do three clusters so remember you have to tell it i'm going to do three clusters it's going to say okay I'm going to find the grouping, uh, I'm going to find three clusters such that this metric, this sum, so over each, uh, over each cluster we're summing the distances from each point in the cluster to the middle of the cluster and squaring that, this total sum is going to be minimized. And that seems kind of like a natural thing to do. We're going to see that although this seems like a natural thing to do, it can lead to problems, but at a high level it seems like a good natural thing to do because what we're doing is we're really minimizing the uh, the kind of volatility within each cluster. We're making sure each cluster is kind of compact and each within each of its little uh, domains by itself. So it seems like a good thing to do. So now, with uh, in, enough with the mathematical framework, we're going to go right into the application now. So as I said before, we're going to rename these variables x and y. So actually, x is going to be, and I'll explain this, it's going to be 9 a.m. temperature, and we're going to measure in Celsius, and y is going to be 9 a.m. relative humidity, or h, and we're going to measure it in percentage. So uh, you can go to the website, the Australian Weather Data website. I'll post it in the description, and you can pull a lot of data. So we're going to be looking at this for this month, March of 2016. And we're going to be looking at all the days in March 2016 that have happened so far. And there's a lot of different columns. For example, there's 9 a.m. temperature, there's 3 p.m. temperature, there's 9 a.m. relative humidity, 3 p.m. relative humidity, stuff about wind speed, maximum wind gust. But we're going to try to keep it simple. We're going to see if we can get a decent accuracy with just these two variables first. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different uh, sites associated with Australia. So we're going to look at Canberra. It's going to be one of our sites. We're going to look at another site called Kalgoorlie Boulder. And the third set we're going to look at is kind of special. It's going to be called Mawson. And I say it's special because it's not actually in Australia. It's a it's in Antarctica. It's a it's a base uh, it's an Australian base in Antarctica. And I chose this one because it's going to kind of highlight our clustering method and kind of show its power uh, a lot better than if we just chose stuff that it kind of, it's, it's, you can't really tell any of the clusters apart. So what I mean by that is, since this is in Antarctica, we're going to have really low temperatures. In fact, they're all negative uh, Celsius temperatures. So if this is zero degrees Celsius, for example, uh, and also when you have these uh, desert and tundra climates, you tend to have really low humidity values. So we're going to say a lot of those points are going to be clustered in this low humidity, low temperature zone. And for Canberra and uh, Kalgoorlie Boulder, it's going to be more in this area up here. The higher temperatures, the higher humidity. So anyway, we'll uh, let's see the exact data and see uh, how k-means operates on this data set. Let's go ahead and take a look at that 9 a.m. Uh, temperature in centigrade to 9 a.m. relative humidity and percentage for our data set. So let's expand this here. We see that the color of the points tells us which geographic location they came from. So these red points here on the left, it's very clear that they're distinct from the other ones, uh, comes from the Mawson base in Antarctica. As we expected, the temperature uh, is very low. It's always below zero Celsius. Uh, and the humidity is usually pretty low as well. But there are certain points up here uh, which might throw off our prediction model a little bit. Now, a little bit harder to predict will be the stuff on the right here. So we see that we have intermingling of green points, which are kind of towards the bottom, kind of lower humidity values, and the blue points, which are kind of towards higher humidity values. So these are from the other two geographic zones. Now, this might pose kind of a problem for our clustering, just because it's, especially in the middle here, it's kind of unclear which point will go with which. But let's go ahead and run the clustering and see what happens. So uh, I'm going to exit the screen, and what's going to happen is the next screen that's going to pop up is going to be the prediction. So uh, pay attention, kind of, uh, one big thing you can pay attention to is these three points up here because they're not going to be predicted correctly. So let's go ahead and see what the prediction says. This is based on k-means. All right, so uh, now k-means assigned its own colors. So this blue pack right here is assigned more or less correctly. It's it's pretty impressive here how well it does. It it classifies all these uh, correctly as the Mawson base. Uh, but as we said before, these three points are also part of the Mawson base. They, they are kind of just special. I, I don't want to call them outliers because I don't know if they are. But they're a little bit special in the case that they have higher humidity values than we'd expect from this other batch right here. So what k-means does is it groups these red points, these uh, three points here, which are from Mawson, with uh, another one of the territories, 
right here. So it groups all these uh, points up here in the top top half of the plane, and then it kind of groups some at the bottom here. So the real question we want to know is, you know, it looks like it did an okay job, but what's the percentage uh, accuracy? So let's close this here, and we'll get a print out of the percent accuracy. So we see here, percentage accuracy is 81.43%. So it's not bad. It's not doing uh, you know that bad of a job, uh, but it is mis mispredicting a few things. So this is just kind of a case example in k-means. Uh, it it has a very simple and directed goal. It wants to minimize that the sum of those distances across the different clusters you use, uh, and it'll do it. Uh, but the case is that it's not always going to be correct because sometimes you're going to have certain points that just don't fit a certain batch. There's no real reason any kind of clustering would. Uh, say that point went with that batch um, and so it won't assign it to that batch at all so there's always going to be that error but besides that there's some other problems some inherent problems with k-means um, and let's look at those problems right now so what we're going to do we're going to switch out one of the geography territories for a different one so we're going to switch out calgary boulder for uh, catherine so we're going to go ahead and do that we're going to see what we get with that graph Okay, let's expand this graph here. So we see that the two territories that stay the same here are this, this blue one and the, the Antarctic one here in red. But we see that the new one is this green one. So to a human, this seems like the job is going to be much easier, right? Because we see there, of course, the Antarctic territory has this natural huge divide in the middle. And we see this really nice divide forming between this blue, these blue dots here and these green dots here, namely this rift right here. So we think, you know, K means some kind of, it's a clustering algorithm. It should do a really good job and it should be able to pick up on this. So let's see what actually happens. So I'm gonna exit out and the next screen we're gonna see is the colors that K means predict the uh, classification. So let's open this up. Surprisingly, what happens, first let's note some other, some very smaller things. All these blue points here are predicted correctly just as they were in the previous model. And it still misclassified these three points up here because they're kind of, separate from these other Ant Antarctic points down here. But the most surprising thing is that it assigns terribly to this third one that we put here, this Catherine uh, geography right here. It does a very terrible, terrible job. It just lumps it in with uh, Canberra right here. And the third cluster, according to this run of k-means, is just kind of these 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 uh, points up here. So this one, two, three, four, five, six, sevens up here constitute the third cluster. And the first cluster is the Antarctic one, and the other one is just all these points right here, most of which belong to uh, two different territories. So it's doing a terrible job, and our accuracy level has shot down uh, very, very, very much. Now, to close out this video, let's take a really quick look at why k-means failed us in that last example. So as we noted before, k-means is by no means perfect. In fact, there's a lot uh, more sophisticated clustering techniques uh, that we can and will use. It's just that k-means is a really good beginner look, a really good uh, introductory look at clustering. But let's look at two major failings of k-means. And there's uh, more than two, of course, but we'll look at these two because one of them is the one we just saw. And uh, also because uh, they pop up a lot more than the other ones might. So first, let's look at what we just saw in that previous example. We're going to kind of exaggerate it to get an idea of what's going on and why it didn't give us the cluster we want. So I'm going to be kind of high level here and say, let's say we have two blobs, okay? Two clusters. Let's say we have one, which is very elongated here, and it looks kind of like this. And let's say we have another one right next to it, and it's also just very elongated. So they're shaped pretty much the same. And we have it here. So this is cluster two here, and this is cluster one. And I give them labels already because as humans, we're, we, we're able to tell right away that there's two clusters here and there's no doubt in our mind. So we're saying, hey, k-means, uh, I mean, obviously there's two clusters here. So can you just classify them for me? K-means says, okay, so you're telling me there's gonna be two clusters. So we say, okay, do two clusters. K-means says, okay, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say your first cluster is the top half of cluster one and the top half of cluster two is gonna be my first cluster. And the second cluster k-means will spit out is, let me do this in blue, let's say. It's gonna say the bottom half of cluster one and the bottom half of cluster two together constitute the k-means second cluster. You're probably saying, why Why did you do that? K-means seems like a terrible method uh, if it would do something like that. Well, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Let's look at what it's actually doing. It's actually doing a really good job for what it's designed to do, which is it's trying to minimize that, uh, that, in, that uh, intragroup sum of squares uh, across all the clusters. And let's see what that means. So let's say k-means did pick the natural clusters that we think it should pick, namely this big elongated blob here and this big elongated blob here. Let's say it picked that. So let's just reproduce them down here for clarity. So let's say here's that cluster one, here's that cluster two. 
Now the issue, the issue we have with this is what's the midpoint of these clusters going to be? Let's say it's somewhere in here. So here's the midpoint of cluster one and here's midpoint of cluster two, right? Now, what, what happens here? So we have a point up here and a point down here, point up here, point down here. Now, k-means is going to have to account for the square of the distances between the point up here and the midpoint, the point down here and the midpoint, uh, similarly with these. So this is kind of a relatively big distance. Now let's look at what happens if it does what it actually did in the sense that it picked the two clusters as one cluster like this and one cluster like this. So I've separated them just for clarity. So cluster one and cluster two. What are the midpoints of these clusters going to be? So naturally you want to say it's something in the middle here. Since there's nothing here, we're just going to arbitrarily say, all right, well, it's going to be the midpoint of this one will be here and the midpoint of this one will be right here. That's kind of close to the middle-ish. Uh, and let's look at what happens to the distances here. So this really makes the distances smaller because now if we're looking at stuff inside this blob right here, remember, uh, this is all one cluster here and this is all one cluster here, down here, one, two. If we're looking at these distances here, they're, they tend to be a lot smaller, a lot more tame than these kind of massive gaps right here that we're seeing if we did the natural clusterings. And if we look at points in here that go to this point, you know, they're not as bad either uh, as something like uh, if we were to take this whole distance right here, which is what we had to do here. And, and the same thing here. We're looking at points, these kind of distances and these kind of distances versus this whole distance right here. And this, as you can see, this really hinges on the fact that the two blobs are really close together or even kind of overlapping a little bit. Because if these blobs get farther apart, then the distance from this point to over here gets bigger and bigger, and it makes more sense to actually just assign the two clusters that we naturally see. So uh, you can think of these two blobs as being even closer than I've drawn them here. So very, very close. So we see that this is the problem. K-means, for what it's designed to do, it's doing its job. We have to give it the benefit of the doubt. It's doing only what it's uh, what is designed and being told to do, which is minimize that intergroup sum of squares across all the clusters. But that's not good for us because that leads to clusters that aren't obvious or inherent um, based on what we see visually. So this is a very big drawback of k-means, and that's what we saw going on with the uh, Catherine and the Canberra data kind of just being put together into one giant blob. Um, because we saw that, as we as we saw, there was kind of that Catherine data kind of followed this blob-like structure over here that we see here. So that was one of the problems. The other problem is a much more, uh, this number two, the second failing of k-mean is it, you, you can even kind of say it's our fault because the biggest thing I've been saying since the beginning is that k-means needs to know the number of clusters you want. It can't figure it out. There's certain clustering methods that, uh, you know, can figure it out and those that are sophisticated. We'll look at those later. But at least k-means and many other clustering methods, it needs to know exactly how many clusters you want. So let's see why this is a problem. First of all, we were lucky to know that this, uh, the weather data we had was coming from three different geographies. So we knew that, you know, we're going to choose three clusters. Why would we choose two? Why do we choose four if we know that we're trying to get three different groups? But that's not always the case. In fact, most of the time, you don't know how many sources your data is coming from. You kind of, you're, you're forming these clusters um, for the first time. It's not like this data is coming from predefined sources. So let's see visually why this is a problem. Let's say we have this big circle here. Let's say we have, uh, let's use orange, number two, and we have green, number three. So as we can see, this should be three clusters. We should tell k-means that we want three clusters. And if we told it we want three clusters, it might even do its job and give us these three circles because there's not really this elongation problem going on. If these clusters are far enough apart, think of them as not being as close as I've drawn them, but being really far apart, uh, then we don't really get this issue that we're seeing here. That we, that we see uh, with uh, these elongated clusters over here. But if we didn't know that, if we were trying to be safe and say, okay, let's just do two clusters just to be safe because I don't know how many I want. What is likely to happen is that it will split this cluster three. So what I mean by that is it'll just split this cluster three in half, put this half of cluster three with cluster one and put this half of cluster three with cluster two and say, okay, here's your two clusters, one and a half of three, two and a half of three. And I mean, although this might not be a big deal, we're certainly losing a lot of information about this, the distinctiveness of this cluster three, because we're telling it we want two clusters. And you can have similar problems when you give too many clusters, because we can see there's three clusters here. If we wanted four clusters, then k-means is arbitrarily going to kind of try to cut something out and form like a fourth cluster when there's really no real reason this, this part of two and this part of one should be together. So we might draw false conclusions from that as well. So it's important to know the drawbacks of k-means. Uh, in the next video, we'll, look at, we'll keep looking at the Australian weather data, and we'll see that 
by using a method called spectral clustering, we can really, really improve upon the accuracy of that uh, failed model we looked at last.